Your sunglasses. sunglasses here. All right. Thank you, sir. You're going to have to come on one time, Tom, oh. just to talk about when we poached the the uh, white sea bass from you. We knocked you off anchor. Well, I think we're on the air, Danny. We're live I screwed up. Oh, yeah. That's all right. That's I know, and that. I think I dropped an F-bomb. If funny, I did, I apologize, a, everybody. That was a funny story in itself. Yeah, Tom yeah. Burgess, Lab, Tony Quest, the guys that uh, we ran boats with and were around a long time, and we just laughing it up. We should have been taping this, Phil. I'm telling you, man. Telling you. If we would have, it would have been gold, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But we will. We promise to get Tony and, and Tom back. That'll be fun. Yeah. Be fun times. So we have a lot of stories, and oh, that's what this is all about, you know, yeah. reaching back in time and, and dealing with guys that we ran boats with and, and uh, dealt with all these lives, or, you know, all these years, excuse me, lives, yeah. <laughs> We've had one life so far, thank God. Exactly. But, uh, no, it's been, it's been a great, great deal, and it's so fun seeing these guys and talking to them about the old times. Yeah, darn uh, right, Danny. You no, know, there's nothing like it. There's a lot of history there. We we can talk about the evolution and you know everybody that we knew. It's just just good times. You know, that's what fishing's all about, folks. I mean, that's why we do this, right? Phil? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, it, it's conveying you know the stories, telling the stories, and and uh, you know having Tony Cuesta here. And Tony was here. He was running Tornado and all the other boats. Tom, you know, I was over at at uh, Ports of Call when Tom had the landing over there. And, Came over here with Frankie Hall and I'm talk about Roger Hess, all the the old guys that we uh, we worked with, and it was just a great time. It was a real tight knit family, you know, and um, it was it was back when Northern boats were the Northern boats and Southern boats were the Southern boats. Yeah. Before we started to really integrate and work together down there, um, but I think I've told those stories. I think some of that, some of the thing that had to play with that was there's two Northern boats up here. It was a new Hustler. George Mayo, my code boat, and then myself when I had the Mustang, we went down to San Diego, and we didn't tell those guys. We were the only ones that had the new uh, Westmark color scanning sonars. And uh, after we smoked them that year, with and we were blessed in that we had awesome fishermen. We had some of the, probably the best fishermen in the fleet, you know. And what that did, too, was it helped break that barrier between the north and south. Kind of like the Civil War, only, <laughs> only with fishing, you know. Yeah. But it really did, and there was we all started to work together, and uh, it made for a, a much better relationship. And so um, now we don't we don't have that to speak, you know. So, but those are some of the historical things that that we've seen in time, and we were blessed to have seen and been there through that evolution. Absolutely. So, yeah, no, it's been a fun ride, Phil. You know, and we, we were there at the best of times. I mean, not much else we could say about that. It was fun, but that would have made a tremendous show. And we we're going to have to definitely get Tony. We'll get him back. And, they want to go to the horse races. Oh, yeah. Oh, Those, they're a couple, they're <laughs> they're a couple off, horse players. They really are off to the yeah, horse Yeah, we'll have to go, man. Oh, my God. That'd be yeah, fun. <laughs> that would be out of control. <laughs> and if you notice, the show's being filmed in a different way today because I pushed the wrong button and. How you reverse that at this point? I don't know. So I'm holding the camera for an hour tonight. It's a little jiggly. I apologize, That's right. everybody. That's right. Hey, Jeff Young. the real deal. Jeff is a, oh, a Navy guy, and today is December the 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. Oh, yeah. So it's a good time to thank him for his service. Oh, he yeah. Says, thank you. Good evening, Phil thank and Danny. So How about the great halibut fishing going on now? Man, the pride with another 35 halibut. Unbelievable, it's Christmas time. Unbelievable fishing. Yeah. You know, I mean... You know, and I mean, if you want, you take a shot, go out a few more, get out on the bank, and there's still units out there. Yeah, uh, Polaris Supreme, 60 bluefin, 7 yellowfin on their last two-day trip. Yeah. Just got in yesterday. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, they're not, and folks, we've been saying this. I've been saying this. The minute we saw the squid, you know, and the volume of squid coming into all those banks, you know, um, there's enough biomass to support all those fish throughout the winter, throughout the year. So I don't expect them to move. The only tough part generally in fishing and, and from running boats, I will tell you from my perspective, the only thing is you don't have quite the coverage because you, you don't have the number of boats covering the areas. So if there's a miss, it's because you can't be on two edges of the bank at the same time if it's going off. Yeah. And so, you know, once you have the coverage, it makes it a lot easier. But the fact that do those fish go back? Are they going across the Pacific, you know, like they, they say they used to, to Japan and then back? No, I don't think so. Not when you got the uh, the squirts there, 
you know, they, 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 they just love that. They fatten up really well on them. I'm sure it helps the, the flavor of the, of the tuna, too, down the road. But. Well, hey, I, I mean, I quote you almost on every morning briefing. This morning on the morning briefing, I said, hey, Danny Cadota nailed this down a long time ago. He said, with all this local squid around, those fish have nowhere to go. They, they have no reason to go anywhere. And let me, let me present this to anybody that thinks differently, too. You know, when we were fishing even during the summertime, and we're down there at uh, 150, 150 fathoms or so. You know what the water temp down there is? It's pretty cool. Yeah, oh yeah. Okay. So it's not any different from what the water temp is here, only that you have an abundance now of squid naturally spawn in on these outside banks and at the islands. And so there's a tremendous amount of, you know, biomass and, and, and fish and bait uh, to sustain these fish year round. So. Uh, they're not going anywhere, folks. I think we're going to see, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's going to be a short winter, but certainly if, if you get on those spots, you know, it's easy for one boat to miss. But when you have, a, a, you know, a, a group and a fleet of boats out there, it's easy for them to, provided they're all working together, stay on that bunch of fish. And so they're not going anywhere. So, you know, and I think it, it'll just get better. I mean, with that amount of bait, maybe we'll see some of the tails and some of the other species move up. You know, I so, think, man. I think we're looking yeah, down the year, and think, probably bodes well for the spring bite of next absolutely. year. Absolutely, right? Absolutely, we're going to roll right into it. I think, you know, these guys on the pride here at Twenty Second Street. Well, they've been on it the whole. I mean, I don't think God, they're going to stop fishing this year. Well, they can pretty much pick. What do you guys want to go fish? Halibut, sea bass, you know, yellowtail. You know, the only thing I think may take off with the water temps is maybe the Dorado, but who knows? This morning, I don't think I, it's going to get extra cold, so they. They even may stick. Who knows? This morning I was doing the morning briefing and somebody yells out, Hey, morning briefing! And I turn around and there's a guy with a surfboard and it's Robbie, one of the kids that decks on the Pride. Awesome. He comes over there all the time. So, <laughs> yeah, it was great. So oh, I worked him great. in. That's awesome. Yeah, I worked him in in the morning that's briefing. Awesome. He's a great kid, hard that's worker. That's so cool. All that's right, so Cue Ball cool. says he's happy to be here. And uh, applause for everybody. Goblin Shark Head, Stimule, yeah. <laughs> and Albert Ponce says, good evening, Phil, Danny, and Freeman Adventures family. Albert, it has been way too long since I've seen you. Gary oh, Bush, yeah. hi, Danny. When are we fishing Pyramid, he wants to know. Oh, you mean for the, the cuts, the big cutthroat? I don't know. Or you, you're not the local Pyramid where there's stripers and stuff like that, you know? But, yeah, the pyramid, I, I, I want to get up the, the Pyramid to go fish those cutthroat, too, you know? But that's... That's on my bucket list. I still haven't caught up. I've driven past there many, many times. Oh, really? But You've I've, never I've, fished it? I've never fished it. You know, the guys usually have their ladders. I've got friends that go up there, the Corky O'Coys and all these guys. And, and uh, you know, I'm sure we'll pull out the fly rod. But you know, I will bring everything, you know. I'll bring all the hardware, the whole deal. But, I mean, yeah, if uh, it's catching them on a fly, I'll catch them on a fly, whatever it takes, you know. All right, good stuff. Yeah. Hey, hit that like button out there, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is a special early edition. In about 10 or 15 minutes, Danny is going to tell you about a special guest he's going to have Saturday. We're going to build the suspense for 10 minutes. You're going to love it, and you'll be able to participate because it will be a live show. And I promise to push the right button so we, <laughs> we're watching this the right way. Well, I can promise you, you guys might want to even wear adults. may want to wear pampers because on that show, you may be wetting your pants from laughing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't want to give too much away till it's time. Phil gives us to go ahead. I'll, we'll let the cat out of the bag, but you guys are really going to be treated to some, you know, he's an icon in this industry. And, yeah. I can't yeah, wait. So anyway, another five minutes. We'll, we'll talk. Yeah. We'll, we'll go through the questions right now. And Travis uh, Bright says, good afternoon, guys. Travis afternoon, brought Travis. his little daughter to the Christmas party, by the way. The Christmas party was a lot of fun, wasn't it? Oh, my God. Was it awesome? I talked to some Mine guys who talked to you, and they said, I just spent the best hours of my life talking to Danny. Such a nice guy. So knowledgeable. and It's just so much like just being on the boat and running boats again. You know, I just having the passengers and, and, and chilling with all these people. And they, they're just, and they're all great people, which just makes it even better, you know? Yeah. And I love that. I love the camaraderie. It's such a great setting there. Oh, it's a great Beach setting. Club. It, it doesn't get any better. Our volunteers yes. who made that all come oh, together. Everybody. Doug, who provided all the chickens and so much more. La Fogata Restaurant. 
Uh, Absolutely. Sean, he, phenomenal. he did a great job. Absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, everybody, time. Jesse great and her daughter, Tori, yep. they were precious. Bob Gifford, Greg Bates, the elf, the demented elf. <laughs> I mean, that, that tell me that's not what a horror movie is made of. You know what? He got to come on the boat like that. Got it. Yeah. I, I think somebody might shoot him, <laughs> throw him overboard. <laughs> yeah, he definitely could get a, a job in Hollywood as a demented elf. I could just see him with a Perfect. knife between his teeth. And yeah, oh my god. Oh my god. Just kidding, awesome. Greg. Hey, Q Ball says hi, and Gary Bush says he going back to fishing pyramid. He says, "Meet you and Bradley. You know those guys. He wants to fish." Pyramid. Pyramid. Me, you, him, you, and Bradley. I, I'm i game one of these days. Like I said, I, I, I'm thinking more maybe winter, I'm, you know, can't take the cold too much anymore. But, you know, and if you're talking about hey, there's two pyramids, the pyramid that we, they got the stripers at. Yeah, right. Just about can't stay. But pyramid up north where they got the Lahatan, the uh, cutthroats. Oh, that's, okay. That's, so where is that located? Up, that's up at the corner of Nevada and California. Oh, okay. Up there, and it's a huge trophy fishery. Now, I did talk to some of the local friends that fished it a lot, and they said it has changed. It's gotten a little cutthroat, you know, people getting very possessive. What they do, Phil, is these guys that are fly fishing, because you want the elevation so you can get your loop out of the water. Yeah. They have ladders, and these guys have ladders staked out all over oh, the lake. Oh, you're kidding me. So you wade out to the ladder, and then you climb up. And you know you have more clearance for your fly line, you know. But yeah, that's 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 on my list, you know. And catching them on a fly is certainly that's a lot of fun too, you know. All right, well, yeah. Gary Bush has Nevada cue ball. Danny, do there you is. know how the fishing is in Visaya and Tulare? No, I have no clue. The closest, the closest I used to fish over there is probably. I mean, and it was toward a, a kind of in between was Isabella. And at one time, Isabella was in the running for, you know, trophy largemouth. And uh, they kicked out some some pretty decent fish there. I could not spend enough time there. And the problem when you get up at Isabella is that wind. And when that, it, it's got a, a green, yellow, orange light, and then a red light. Yeah. Telling you, you know, when you got to get off. And when they tell you to, you know, it, it hits orange, never. You better kick it in the tail for the for the marina because I've been there when it's blowing and it's brutal. Tony Quest is yeah. in the house, isn't he? He probably you know, you want me to put the camera on you, Tony, no, or no? Oh, come on, Tony. Okay, right. well, Tony, I'm promise never... you're going to be yeah, in one of the shows. Yeah, I will. Okay, we got to have Tony. I mean, Tony was here Twenty Second Street. You know, when we he's were a here big part of this business. Kenny and Roger I knew Hess and Frankie Hall. His and father was you name it. I Galley mean, Cook. Even yeah, on the Redondo I mean, Special when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. And, and Tony can recall all those, all our crew members. So you don't want to be on, on Tony? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta put my wig on. No, no, no. I got mine out in the car. If you want to borrow it. No, I don't like yours. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Fish Guy says Phil and Danny love listening and learning from you guys. Also. Would like to fish pyramid with you guys if you're up in this area. You can whack the fish at pyramid by trolling down riggers or jigging too. There you go. Fish guy must be up there, man. Yeah, that's cool. And we'd I'm love getting, to fish you with know what? you too. I like getting him anyway. It's just that yeah, I've got some good friends, guys like Corky Okoye and a whole group of guys that were going up there fishing on with a fly, and uh, you know, so I mean they hold that over my head. You know, I'll probably want to hit, nail one or two with a fly, too. But, I, you know, I'll fish the hardware. I'll fish the little mini iron and whatever it takes to catch fish. I'm I'm into catching them. And to me, in any type of fi fishing, it's not about an arrogance to catch them only one way. It's about figuring it out, folks. It's always going to be like that. And that's going to kind of segue into this time of year. Like, my big goal in life right now, this time of year, is take all my little grandkids fishing. Yeah, there you and go. And you go to the put and take trout lakes, but j to get them hooked, you know, and have that blessing that was bestowed upon me at a very, you know, from the age of four, you know, and that messed me up forever, you know. That's what I want to do. Yeah. That's where my goal is now, this stage of my life. Yeah. To pay it back to the community, to, you know, my the kids and grandkids, you know, and everybody else that we could help out. I mean, it was fun doing that. Deal with Chuck and the guys with the Redondo Club. You oh know, man, I, it was I a had blast! A fun time handing handing off. I mean, gives me more pleasure. And what 
another trout's not a big deal, but to hand off six little, you know, six trout to these kids. You were red hot yeah, there. Yeah, I was, yeah, I got lucky. But I mean, but it, again, it's just been around long enough. You have to keep working till you figure it out. And once you figure it out, you know, that's, but that's the key. That's the key. You yeah, you got to keep, gotta trying, keep, keep, yep. I noticed the really good fishermen, that's what they do. Dave Dodge, I watched him do that one day at a lake. You got to run Where I was like, I was there to just talk to Dave and relax and yeah. not be doing a report. But Dave was all about, no, I'm going to figure this out. And he figured it out. You know, there's there's some simple things for better fishermen, too, where you can get away with light line. Obviously, to me, this time of year, two pound is going to be your best choice. I mean, it's, it's strong enough to hold most of the stuff that they're stocking. And I've got some fish over 10 pounds. You know, but of course it was like Irvine Lake uh, with two pound. But um, you know, generally this time of year with the put and takes, and they'll stock mm. some nice fish, and you'll see you'll see some really nice fish in some of these local lakes. But the key really is the lighter line. You know, smaller hooks. You know, when it gets touchier, it's just like fishing bluefin. You know, people think, oh yeah, the trout are going to swim around and eat everything. It's not true. It's not true. You got to take them with the same intensity level of, of figuring them out as you do a tuna. And I think with all, all species, it corresponds that way. You know, you got to get your head, you know, open to and thinking, what am I doing wrong? What, you know, look at the conditions, look at what, what's going to be more conducive with this particular, you know, set of uh, criteria, whether it's wind, current, whatever it might be, water temps. You know, water temps get cold. You may have to slow down your approaches, fish a little deeper, you know. But it's processing all that, putting in that computer up there. And, uh, you know, we've been, Tony, we're talking about that. Tom, we're all talking about that, you know, after running boats. You know, there's a, you got 60 eyeballs at least looking at you for the most part. So you better figure things out. The pressure's on. That's what it's on. about. Yeah. That's what it's all about. All right, in one minute, Danny's going to announce his new guest. Oh, hang on, everybody. I'm going to switch mics there for a second, so you might hear a pop or something. Like that. An idea here. Okay. A brilliant idea. All right. Where I won't have to hold this. Oh, yeah, put it back up on the stand. Yeah, maybe if I put this freaking thing in. <laughs> hang on, everybody. All right. All right. I doubt it. Oh, my God. Hey, Tony. that's a pretty little... Uh, gobbledygook down on the bottom of that phone. I've never seen it. I'm telling like you, man. You know, you got the high-tech stuff, Phil. I'm telling you. You know, I'm about as low-tech as you can get. We broke it out. Yeah, if I only knew how to use it, it'd be great. <laughs> I got my hand in front of the <laughs> camera and everything else. All right, oh let's see if this God. is actually going to work. Hang on, everybody. Oh, I see it. Can we see Danny yet? Almost. Are we too low now? Are we good? Let's see how this works. I think this might work. I'm going to move in on you a little yeah, bit no, more. Yeah, no, that's not a problem. Perfect. We're getting, sorry, folks, we're dialing it in. Yeah. It's like anything else. Dialing like it fishing, in folks. as the show goes on. Just like fishing. We'll figure just, it you out. Just throw right it there, Tony. We're just going to, we'll get it figured out, and then bingo, we're, we're good. We're <laughs> yeah, golden. right. We're golden. Nobody we believes that with me running this thing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're good. Um, awesome. All right, let's see. Do you want to uh, make an announcement as to who it is? All right, so on Saturday, folks, and I think we have it scheduled at 4, don't we, Phil? 4 o'clock. I've got a friend that I uh, fish with and actually been family with I'll basically for many, many we'll years. Okay. And you're going to get some stories you. you won't even believe. We'll see you, Tony. Yeah. Um, Gary Loomis is flying in. You know, the originator, G. Loomis, originally started uh, with, you know, implementing graphites back in the Lama glass days. You know, Lamy. Lammy was really one of the, he was, you know, they were on the forefront of everything. And so, anyway, Gary's coming in Saturday. We're going to shoot over here at 4 p.m. Tune in, people. Um, for a lot of you guys, you older guys, you might want to put on a pair of pampers because I got a funny, funny feeling you guys are going to be laughing so hard you might wet your pants. Uh, but, yeah, he's a crack up. We have stories. I've got stories that he doesn't know about that I've got written down. It's surprising, and, and it's going to be a laugh-a-thon, trust me, because I'm, he's got stories on me, and and uh, I don't want to spoil any of them. But tune in for a special so show on Saturday at 4, Phil, I think we said? 4, four o'clock, live. Live. From 22nd Street Landing. guarantee you will have a gut ache from laughing. Do you want to tease any? I mean, how long have you guys known each other? Oh, my God. You know... 
I was just getting off, I, I just retired off the boats and I was doing some, uh, I was on a lot of pro stats for a lot of different companies and um, I get a call from them wanting me to put up a display and promote a company called G Loomis, who I didn't know a whole lot about. I did, I did through my bass fishing because I was actually, I take that back. I was already on their pro staff, but I was fishing. I wasn't doing anything other than that. With, yeah. You know, the new rods. And they had, you know, the very best rods for bass fishing at the time. And, um, you know, they're the most sensitive. The first ones were the graphite scrims. And I can explain all that. Oh, you know what? Better yet, I'm going to have him explain it. Yeah. Me. Because yeah, that changed go. the game for us back in those days when we were crowded fishing or for any sensitivity type fishing. It's that, that, Sensitivity is so much greater with graphite scrim because it, it deadens it when you use a fiberglass scrim. The fiberglass scrim makes it a little more durable, but durability wasn't what I was about. I wanted, I wanted to know when my crowdhead was going to transmit and tell me there's a fish there. And with the right tackle and the technology, we had that edge. And that's, <clears throat> that's what worked. I mean, back in those days, I mean, it, it was pre spectra. I imagine if I had my uh, graphite scrim rods with my spectral, you know, spectral line that we use now, I, and fluorocarbons. I think I'd have been even. We would have been even more dangerous. Oh deadly. my God, for you know, sure. Been dangerous, yeah. So you know, um, when he gets here, you know, I got him to do some of the first straight saltwater graphite series, and that was it. Wasn't for everybody, and you know, um, it still isn't. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I will fish it because I know that it recovers faster. It's just more efficient, casts further, lift quicker. But we'll have to explain that to you. I mean, so often I'll sit down on a Saturday and I'm watching a bass fishing show and I'm watching these guys high stick and I'm looking at these are quote unquote pros. And I look at them, I go, my God, these guys don't know how to fish. They're getting paid all this money. They got all these sponsors and I'm watching them and they got terrible terrible fishing mechanics folks you know so if you learn one thing off this show we're going to teach you how to fish correctly and that has to do with keeping your rod down you exert so much more pressure uh hundred percent you know you ch zero chance of blowing the rod up as when you high stick it and get it up in here you know and i, and I watch some of that these guys they're i hate to say it i mean i cringe when i watch some of these guys fishing they're considered pros so um be tuned. Make sure you tune in for that on Saturday because we'll go through some of the historical part of the the fishing and the evolution thanks to Gary Loomis. But I got one even better. You're going to get the historical and hysterical <laughs> because we got some stories, folks. And I kid you not, you might wear some of you older guys might want to put on a pair of pampers because you're going to be laughing so hard you may uh, you may pee in your pants. Man, you I'd know? ask you to tease so, one, no, but that, I think we'll just wait. <laughs> we'll wait because I and. and I, I've got a list, folks. I've been compiling a list. I'm sure Gary's ready for him, too. I mean, he's got the same thing. They pulled jokes and tricks on me over the years uh, up at his house and stuff. But uh, tune in on Saturday. You will die laughing. Would you characterize so, him as a joker? Oh, well, uh, no, a clown. Uh, you know, <laughs> but you know, at one time. Because nobody thinks of Gary Loomis that way. That's why the show is going to be so great. He, you know. They he all was, think of him as innovator oh, and, you know, well, which he, he is all know, of Very that. much. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. You know, very much. And, um, you know, it was a tough nut to crack, but it was perfect for me, too, because I, you know, as far as technology goes, I was always been driven by technical tackle. And it made a huge difference, you know, and it also helped tie together um, the, the marriage I'm going to call it the marriage between Loomis and Shimano because Toyo gave me, I, he would give me prototype reels and, you know, it all correlated. We had the best of the best and uh, too bad. And prior to that time that Russ Iser didn't have a Spectra because I can't even imagine fishing a Spectra with a graphite scrim and some of the, the tricked out little Shimanos that Toyo would get me, you know, and um, it was a killer. You know, but we'll talk about that. And, you know, like I said, I've been very blessed being around these great people, you know, and I want to give them the tribute that they deserve, you know. But this one, I think you're going to be you're going to be laughing. 
laughing yourself into a, a frenzy. Like I say, some of you guys, if you got a weak bladder, put on a pair of pampers because you will laugh hard enough. Uh, you may let a stream go. So um, be prepared on Saturday. But I guarantee you, you, the stories, some of the stories we have, some of the stories he probably doesn't even know I'm going to unleash, you, you're going to go crazy. And, Absolutely. of course, uh, people will be able to ask Gary and you questions. You get to ask Gary the questions. That's even better. Yeah. 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 This might be a long podcast. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be classic. Let me tell you, though. Yeah. 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 Because it, it did change the game. Yeah, it really did. It really did, right? He's oh, an absolutely. innovator who you know, changed. Going with straight graphite, you know, before it was it was implemented with a fiberglass scrim, you know, and that gives it a little more resilience, gives it some more elongation so it, it won't break. I wasn't interested in that. You know, we, I, you know, I was into telling people how to fish correctly, and you'll never break a rod if you handle the rod correctly, if you keep that angle down. You're putting more pressure at it much more pressure at that lower angle and your incidence of breakage is almost zero. Yeah. Where you watch these guys, trust me, I'm watching these bass tournaments on TV and I'm watching these guys high stick and stuff. I go, you know what? These guys need to learn how to fish. They're horrible. You're up here. I'm watching them up here and fighting a fish. People, you got one tenth the pressure on the fish here than you do if you got it down low here and zero percentage of breaking. So the whole thing has to do with getting you guys you educated on these things, and, and that will make you a much more efficient fisherman, whether you're bass fishing, trout fishing, or, or tuna fishing. So that's that's a big thing that we're going to tie into. So make sure you tune in Saturday. All right, yeah, and yeah. we just this guy's ears must be burning because Doug just walked in. We were just talking about you. <laughs> Doug, you did so much for our Christmas party. Oh, my God. Um, what a fabulous party. You Doug. know what? Hats well, off. That's why Doug, you, you know. Absolutely. Oh. Doug, you did so much. Thank and you very much. It was my pleasure. Man, you're an awesome person. I, Absolutely. I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you very much. All, all right. And back here to Danny. But Doug bought all oh. the chickens and oh my worked God. his tail off. Doug, let me tell you something. You know, the payback you gave to me, all those extra chickens, I go to Costco every week to buy four chickens for my dogs. And I take the skin off, debone them. They get, you know, with each batch, I get you know, about a, a day and a half, maybe a, one day out of one chicken. But I make them boneless chicken pieces, wow. dice it up. They get rice and, and peas and carrots. They eat better than I did. Honestly, <laughs> when I went to college... We ate junk. I mean, they actually get better food than I do every day. Right. Thank you so much. Hey, my pleasure. I appreciate Doug, it. Doug, we and love my you, dogs, man. Thank you. My dogs will give you their, their paws. <laughs> you know. Paws up. Yep. Awesome. Thank uh, you so much, Doug. All right. It was awesome. Yeah. Gary Loomis on Saturday right here at Gary 4 o'clock. Doug, four. you should, should be part of the oh, studio audience on yeah, that yeah, one. Yeah, no. It's going to be a... The world you famous guys, Gary Loomis. You, I can guarantee you, you people will be in tears from laughing. I, the stories we have, and he doesn't even realize, but I've got a listing of all the things over the years. Oh, you, you're and just well, going to break the list out yeah. and go down? Yeah, I mean, heck we did, yeah. We did, some, we did family vacations. Um, Is Gary a big-time fisherman? Does he love to fish or not oh, so he much? Did. Not as much now, you know. Yeah. but he, he always did. But you know what? It became, he fished enough like I did where it was almost more fun to clown around yeah. and, and pull tricks and stuff on each other, and, and we I got tricked out. Uh, Part of the show we'll talk about. I drug him out with Dan Hernandez. We filmed the show with Hernandez, and we pulled a bunch of tricks on him. You know, from on Gary or on, on Dan? On 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 Gary. Oh. Dan filmed it, and we did it on my old Mustang. You know, and uh, well, I, I mean, guess I guess the question. Yeah. I I was gonna say I guess the question is, what kind of a trick are we gonna play on Gary in here? Oh, we gotta play one on him right to get this out. thing started. I don't want to get the cat out of the bag. In case he's watching, but yeah, oh, really, there'll always be something with him. We'll figure. Oh, and then and, you know, and then over the years, they've got me many times too. So I mean, he'll he'll tell those stories. You guys will be in tears, you know. I guarantee it. That's gonna be great. Yeah. All right, Saturday, great. four p.m. Yeah. right here on the Freeman Adventures yeah. YouTube channel. You'll be able to check it out. Cue ball says Castaic is like that, Danny. It's windy at times. He says, "Thank you very much for answering." Dane yeah. says, make it happen, Captain. I'm watching from Oceanside. <laughs> hey, Dane, thank you so much. Absolutely. From Montana, Kim Herbert. Kim, I think Montana, right? Kim, no, wait a minute. I forget where you're at. You're like St. Louis. Where are you, Kim? Merry Christmas 
Phil and Danny, Kim's a great guy. He came by and left a note here. Came all the way out from somewhere on the East you know, Coast I or Midwest. At, I look at our, our our people that have called. I got a call from an old old friend here that made a, one of the most famous knots we've ever had here. So the call was called the the Joe Miller knot, the Miller knot. Yeah, I got a and call from his kid or nephew or something. Yes, and Joe listens in the other day. I got this box from him, box of hats. And it's, you know, but this box came and it said Mountain Home, Arkansas. Well, my champion boat, when Rick Grover had it, you know, Rick Grover had the champion dealership. Yeah, it was Mountain Home. It was the only place I place that I knew of a Mountain Home. And I'm thinking, oh, a champion? Send me some of this, this box. Well, Joe's living there. Joe Miller. He used to live in Buena Park, real close to Taka. Yeah. And uh, used to run him. But he was one of the guys, I tell you, one of the greatest guys that sat down there. We did a goof off on the Cherokee. The wind blew. We were tucked in the Guadalupe for I don't know how many, for seven days or so. And in the seven days, he sat in the galley and played with knots and knots, tried them, we broke them. Finally, we get back, we bring it, I think we took it down to Isers and put it on a machine. It's, to this day, it's still the knot I use. I got my record largemouth, you know, bass on it, all those fish I, you know, all those fish I fished on light line, but I tie it on everything, my fly, my tuna, you name it, my bass, you know, which was the, the crucial part back in those days. But just to tell you, like this 10-pound XT that I fished with his knot would break at 17 pounds. And so it was thin, but it was super strong. But it had to do with a guy that was diligent, sat in the galley for seven days because it blew, and, you know, it was just hard. We couldn't even fish. But was diligent enough to keep playing with this knot that he came up with the, I figured at the time, I, to me, I still utilize it. The strongest knot ever I ever fish, and I use it for everything. That is great, absolutely. And he's a guy that's watching our show. Yes, I got, absolutely. I think, I think he, absolutely. yeah, he yeah. sent me the same but, you box. Know, you know, guys like Joe, and I'd run into Joe because he lived out by Taka and Buena Park, you know, and um, I'd see him at the shop all the time. But to have the type of dedication, not only that, he was probably one of the most beautiful fishermen to watch fly line in a bait. Really? He would take a chobie and he'd fling it out and it would hit head first and a chobie would just never even stop. It would just, just go off, zoom off, boom, you know, just beautiful in action. You know, he's fresh in fish water. Fresh water now, it's a little different. I'm sure he's uh, flinging the spinning reel like unbelievable. But, you know, to have fishermen like that, was such a blessing being around all these great guys, innovators, you know, uh, and these guys that develop, whether it's a technique or, or develop the product. Um, I am, just got to tell you, we've been so blessed by all the people here in Southern Cal that we've been around. And we're blessed to have an audience like, I oh, mean, yeah. like well, Joe you know, Miller. We Absolutely. We sent him all our best. This guy yes. sitting behind me, Doug. Absolutely. I mean, once again, the oh. people, and Doug even went out of his way to say to me, Man, I met so many nice people at that Christmas party, and it's just evidence of the kind of people we've managed to attract. And you know, I feel really blessed about that. Oh, absolutely. That's the whole thing. You know, and, and and the industry itself. I mean, we're out there to have a good time. And now, you know, there's there's different points at different you know, stages of our life. Now, yeah, I'm still a very competitive fisherman even at my age now. But it I get uh, more enjoyment now. Out of hooking the hands to like like grandkids and things like that, and that's coming up now. You know, in the winter time, you know, we're, I'm going to haul them out and take them to some of these lakes and go get them going on the trout, especially the little ones, the two year olds, four year olds. You know, and uh, that's the payback. Yeah, you know, that's a big payoff too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I love. Yeah, I'm competitive yeah. too. I don't fish as much as I used to because I've caught so much, and now I love getting the video and I love that whole thing. So. Like you were saying, you guys goof around a lot. That's my thing. But I still am. In other stuff, like when I play basketball with my kids or something, I still try to play basketball. I get, like, somebody is going to get pushed down. And, you know, I just, <laughs> like, my wife, somebody, one of the wives will have to say, hey, you guys are getting a little out of control. <laughs> Dad's almost 70. Go easy on him. Yeah. I remember I got, I was playing baseball as a kid, and it yeah. was a, what do you call it, an intramural game? with So mm -hmm. we had girls playing? Yeah. And I was, like, second base or shortstop or something and i took the ball and i fired it over to first and there was a girl playing there and it like zoomed over her head you know and everybody's like hey what don't do that what are you doing that for and i'm like well what is the point of this i don't because i was so competitive <laughs> yeah i, I yeah. wasn't there to, I'm, the same I'm like what is the i don't get this why don't we just get rid of them and 
I know I sound like a real jerk now, but <laughs> I mean, I was just like, I, w I was playing to win, you yeah, know? Yeah, I get, well, you know, and that's why, Phil, the blessing for, for me, I mean, you're around too, especially with these things, with the camera. Number one, I'm horrible with technical things like the cameras and stuff. Everybody like can I, tell I am, I've had too. all these GoPros. I've had everything, and I can't even turn them on and stuff like that. And I've spent so much money over the years on, on the cameras trying to replicate it. And when it comes down to it, I'm fishing. And so I miss. I do have some. i got to dig them up. I mean, I have I have one. I have to find this. I think it's on a Super 8 or something like that. We or, can transfer that. Or, well, i have to. I got to find it. What I is I've it? Got to, what it is is my dad's fishing a small creek up in Mammoth. Up in Mammoth, oh, Mammoth Creek. Yeah. And our little dog that we found at H and M Land, you know, they found down in San Diego, Ludwig. Okay. How did we come up with that name, Ludwig. by the way? That's a funny story. Probably around a German restaurant or no, something. No, no. What it was was our crew was really into watching Saturday Night Live, and and Bellucci they did a thing on Ludwig van Beethoven, and so he played a wig. I mean, it's probably one of the funniest series you ever said. You know. And uh, so anyway, my crew would mimic all these things, but Ludwig, Ludwig on Beethoven got, you know, that's funny. Was the name that yeah. we, we utilize. But I mean, I think we talked about it. We even, they even, my crew put together a show back while they're cleaning fish. So I'm clean, you know, they were artists, the way they filleted fish. I mean, they cut it down to the boat. It was clean. It was paper thin in between the boat. It was beautiful, right? So they'd always have a, the entire charter was back. 25, 30 people back, but stern and up in the up in the top of the galley on the stairs yeah. up there, watching these guys fillet fish. So one day, Kohei Kikuchi and Marty Tanaka, Taka's oldest son, go back there and they put on a show. And it had to do with John Bellucci doing samurai I remember that. thing, right? Yeah. So they all put on these little headbands, wore it like a hachi, what do they call it, hachimaka, you know? Yeah. And and they're back there cutting fish. Well, they had a couple fish all filleted up. So Kohei's on the back and Marty's in the front. And they're both reenacting a Bellucci skit, right? Well, they're actually, they're implementing their own, innovating their own skit, which was even funnier, okay? So they cut these fish. They have some bags of fillets already made. And so um, <laughs> Kohei starts to cut a fish and Marty goes, oh, no, 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 no. He, and he's trying, neither, none of us, or Kohei spoon, Japanese. But, you know, like I didn't and, Mar and Marty Tanaka didn't, you know. And, but they were, you know, just mumbling it out, rah, 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 you know. And, uh, you know, Marty's trying to chew Kohei out that he's doing it wrong. So Kohei brings the fillet knife and goes like this. And then Marty goes, no, 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 no. He goes, ah, phew. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you remember seeing those scenes. In oh, Bellucci, yeah, yeah, right? yeah, okay. absolutely. I mean, by this time, I'm hearing roaring, right? Roaring from the passengers, these guys putting on a skit for our, That's our charter. That's freaking right? awesome. So, Kohei takes a fish, an albuquerque, throws it up in the air, takes his fortune, goes, hey, shut, chops down like, right? And he picks up a bag of fillets. <laughs> and guess what? You could not even hear the 870 runs roaring over their laughter. Oh, I mean, it's just unbelievable. But I mean, these are fun things, you know, that are more than just fishing. Things that over a lifetime, I mean, they're just classic. Yo, yeah, yeah, good that stuff. Will be etched in people's minds forever. But absolutely, that's, this is what it's all about, folks. You know, having fun too. Kim Herbert is back. in Missouri. That's where he is. Daniel Lightfoot. All right. So awesome. that's Michael Limon. You saw Michael yes, at the Christmas yes, party. Yes, yes. He said, "You guys are on early today, uh, Michael. On my way to my baseball game." <laughs> How are you guys doing? Good luck, Michael. Yeah, get him. Get a home run. Get him, get him. Do something good, man. <laughs> Anthony cool. Noriega is loving you so far here, Danny. He said he originally started bass fishing, and he high-sticked. Shame on me. He says he's <laughs> learning something from you. Anthony, thank you for joining us. Balboa Fish Group, thank you, sir. Uh, cue ball, the primetime players on Saturday Night Live. It was unbelievable. Good yeah. stuff. Yep. All right, so Kim is from Missouri, and Kim is a great person. I know that. Have you ever fished Lake uh, Cuyamaca, east of San Diego? Yes, Great I family have. lake where I learned to fish. Absolutely beautiful up there. I've been up there even when it snowed. 
but I went to school at UC San Diego. So it wasn't that big of a drive. I think it was about 60, 60 something miles or so. And uh, great atmosphere up there. And it feels like you're up in Sierra. You're up, I, I think, about 4,500 feet. But oh, really? I've been up there with snow. But it was a great lake to fish. Is it still? Uh, oh, yeah, it's yeah. still down there. It's, you know, it's one of the typical San Diego lakes that are they're private. But for trout, it's ideal because the, the higher altitude and the cold air and everything, it was perfect for the trout. Yeah, I, I love Cuyamaca. It's absolutely awesome. Yeah, and how far, like from downtown San Diego, how far is the drive? Is I, I want to say it's 60. It's like you go all the way on 8, and then you cut up into the mountains, you know, Alpine. And there's a, one of the... A couple of little places up there, you go a certain time in like in the fall, and they have the apples and uh, the, the different fruits, and they, these places have all these homemade, these pies. Oh, right. Just I mean, there's a lot to do. We'll have to look that up for you. I'll yeah, yeah, yeah. That, but we used to do a lot of that. But Cuyamaca was phenomenal. Yeah. yeah, that sounds great. And it's just like being in the Sierras, only it's a much shorter drive, especially if you're down south. You know, are there campgrounds, accommodations yeah, up there? Yes, or? there were. Yeah, there were. But we we just did day trips because you know I was at up at uh, I was living in Del Mar. You know, so yeah, it's fun stuff. Would you like to go back there at any? Oh, point absolutely, yeah? absolutely. I'd kind of like to see that beautiful, That's beautiful a... lake. It's like a mini version of being in the Sierras. It's I think I want to say maybe forty five hundred feet, something like that. I want maybe five, but it gets snow. Yeah, it gets snow, and I've been up there. But uh, the fishing's phenomenal that I know of. You know. You know, Danny, um, I can't remember the name of this place, but I know Doug would like this. And I, somewhere down the Baja Peninsula, you get down there around, I believe it's Santo Tomas, and there's you go up in the mountains, and they have pine trees. It snows there every once in a while. Yeah, yeah. People Probably catch the trout there. Stuff that you don't equate with Baja and Exa Mexico. Exactly. That's, I forget that name. I can't believe I'm getting that old that really I freaking forgot the name of this well, place. You, but. you know what? Something Somebody just came to mind, there. Phil. It had to do with Cuyamaca. You know, my youngest brother, Steve, is a fisherman. You know, he, you know, he runs the boats and he's on the island. He's built Cherokee mm -hmm. and Steve's been around forever. My middle brother, Dave, is not much of a fisherman, right? So he and his buddy, Dave Ellis, and Ellis is like 6'4", big guy, you know, they go to Cuyamaca. And they're not, like I said, they're not like Steve and I. They're not fishing the floor. Well, they didn't have floor car back then, but they're... They were up there probably more to drink beer and do other things. You know, they were in college. Yeah. So you figure Let that, your imagination you, yeah, run you wild. You can figure that one out pretty easy. I, I play checkers. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> Monopoly. So they're not catching much fish. Well, I think they cut one trout or something like that. And then they, they're throwing out the Zeke's. This is probably before power bait. Zeke's floating cheese. And so the Zeke's is up there. A duck comes over there and grabs Dave Ellis's. And mind you, like I say, Dave is like 6'4", 240, 250, you know. This duck grabs his Zeke's, and Dave winds it in, grabs the duck, rings his head, and throws it in his krill. So not knowing this, they were be these two were being watched the whole time by a fishing game. Uh-oh. So the guy comes up, he says, hey, how are you guys doing? And they go, you know, well, we got one trout. And he goes, um, uh, yeah, what, what's in the krill? <laughs> He opens it up, he goes, it's a duck, comes out, and he goes, uh, oh, and actually what it was, was, can I see your fishing license? They're like, sure, sure. They're showing the fishing license. Can I, can I see your hunting license? Uh-oh. <laughs> we got fined, but he I did? just, I go, what a bunch of donkeys. <laughs> he two donkeys. You know, that's why he doesn't fish. And number one, he doesn't understand us. Yeah. But I mean, that, that was a Cuyamucca deal. Really happened while they were in college, and I just couldn't stop. I oh guess, my god, you dummies! <laughs> that is too funny. Yeah, that true is story. <laughs> out of control. Yeah. Uh, Kim says he lost a white sturgeon at the boat and caught Alpers trout and hatchery grade trout at Quayamaca. Wow, wow! So they got they obviously they put sturgeon in there. Well, it's kind of like uh, Irvine. Yeah, they had some sturgeon in Irvine too. They've got, they used to have them over there at Santa Ana River Lakes also. I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. they do. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Yeah, it's going to be pretty hard to land them on two and four. I know. For the most part, you know, you probably have to be specifically fishing for them. And yeah. I don't know if they have a catch and release program, or a, I don't know what the program is there on that anyway. But yeah, yeah, it'd be fun stuff. All right, Gary Loomis, Saturday, four p.m. with Danny. That is going to be a fantastic show. You guys are going to. Doug die. and I are just going to sit in the audience and enjoy Gary, that one, man. You. I'm not even going to participate. Guarantee I'm just going to watch it. You will be in tears. 
the stories we have. He's got some on me, and I've got a bunch on him, but I guarantee you guys are going to be dying. Yeah. Earlier today, by the way, I just want to send out thanks to several people who stopped by with more clothing. I mean, we can't even move around so out awesome. there anymore. That is so awesome. It's pretty cool. It that? is absolutely yeah. the best. You see Paying that. Paying back to you know, our, our, our friends down south that allow us to fish in their waters. <clears throat> and they're just great people. I mean, it's a great, great charitable deal that you put together. So you too. You're part of it, man. Thank you. you. That's Thank awesome. you. We, we all yeah. enjoy doing it. Yeah. And uh, what's better than playing than Santa Claus, right? Exactly. Exactly. Danny, I want to talk about the Southern California fishery right now because it strikes me that here we are rolling up on Christmas. You've predicted it all year long, but it's still astounding. Blue fin tuna. Is this a year round fishery in SoCal now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. And and, and the thing That's is mind this, boggling. You know, guys talked about you know, it used to be in the old days they would say, Well, you know, the fish are gonna be headed back to Japan across the Pacific. Yeah, right. Yeah, really? When they got the tonnage of squid sitting there, it's like Phil, carnivore, somebody plops a, a beautiful fillet in front of you. Are you going to drive a hundred, you know, or a thousand miles to go have it somewhere else? You just oh, put a big old right there. hook in that and I'll eat there it. There you go. There yeah. you go. Well, you know, and they don't realize all you guys have fished this summer. How many times have we made drops? I, I know on my, my trip in June, I dropped down 350, you know, uh, I was dropping down, you know, awful, awful deep. I was going down, you know, 40, you know, sometimes 50 fathoms, you know, which is 300 feet. 300 feet, right. Okay. right. You know what the water temp down there is, folks? It's got to be cold. It's cold. What, uh, so, you know, guys. So what, like, 50s? Yeah. Low I, 50s? I don't even know. I don't either. But the, the thing is, I don't think the water, I've been looking at some of the ports. I don't think they're expecting the water to get that much colder, you know. Right. A matter of so many degrees. But certainly, Wayne having... The abundance, you know, and the biomass of squid here, there's no reason for them to go anywhere, folks. They're going to be fattening up. We'll see a lot of 300-pounders next year because those, when they hit that certain big, when they get to that one particular size, they'll start growing almost exponentially, you know. But when you have that much feed and that much squid, they're not going anywhere. And they're everywhere. That Probably 60, Cortez, 43. They're probably on every bank, all the islands. There's no reason for them to, to go anywhere. So this is a throwback it. to the late 1800s. Oh, absolutely. off Catalina Island, absolutely. right? Yeah. Uh, it the might be is, better. We're more efficient at it now because That's of the true. tackle. Back then, you know, I mean, even a big 16 old pen, you know, or you know, some of the big reels that they had back then, they didn't even have those. But I mean, I remember fishing with my uncle in Hawaii, and he has his 14 knots and 16 knots. But you look at the drag and the little drags like this, you know, now. The, the capacities and the drag pressures that these new 40 reels pounds can of drag do. on yeah, them. And it could yeah. be the reel could be this big and could do that. So, you know, the opportunity and um, to, to land a big fish, especially with the tackle we have now, is that much greater. Is that much so, greater. here's another question for you Is there anywhere, else, and I'm not kidding here, is there anywhere else in the world where you can do this? Then so, I, I mean, in I the kind with all these so. big numbers, I don't. Think I know so. the East Not Coast has numbers. a good fishery, but they don't catch yeah. Yeah. fifty fish, sixty fish, no, 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 hundred fish on a trip. Yeah, no, no. And look how many, look how many boats in the fleet we have. Yeah, and they're not only doing it there, we're doing it from here to Oregon. These guys are catching bluefin in Oregon, in Washington. You know, you know, we didn't see we a handful of albias that we were hoping for. But, you know, they had wonderful Albie fishing up there, yeah. you know, and they were coming down. And, you know, we just we just don't know. Same type deal. You know, those fish uh, with all the biomass and the feed and the water, there's, there's, you know, no reason for them to go anywhere, you know, go across the Pacific anymore. You know, so I'm sure even those things, if, if we ever see them, they're going to be in they're probably feeding up pretty good right now. They're they, going to be wide open next year. It's yeah, Albuquerque so gonna, everywhere. Just, One of these years, I'm going to get it right. We keep saying it. We will get it right eventually. Yeah. It it's a cycle, folks. You know, we get, as fishermen, just get used to adapting and be able to switch over, whether it's an El Nino fishery with, with lighter lines and game fish or, you know, and, and my gosh, we, we have it all. Because, I mean, you know, I, you go up, when I left in June, you know, we, we had uh, our daytime fish, for the most part, were smaller. So we're fishing with lighter lines, like your 30-pound, stuff like that. 
but then occasionally you do hook some of these big ones, you know, but at night you're growing up and you're fishing generally 100, 130s, you know, and fishing down deep, you know, with the big knife jigs and stuff. And, um, you know, so, you know, just be prepared. Well, you, you have, to, that's the only problem is you have to take everything now. You know, you just don't know what's going to be out there and what's happening, you know. And, and the fact that, uh, you know, you're fishing day and night now, which is really tough on the cruise. I was just going to say. Really how tough. How brutal is that? Let me tell you, those poor guys, they don't get any sleep. And I if know. If they bite, it's even worse. Right. You know. Because, so you, you know, you can take a nap and, hey, wake me if they bite. And you're praying they're not going to bite. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you'd like to get a couple hours of sleep. I, I got to tell you, Phil, I don't know. I, my hat's off to these guys. Me too. I never had to do this. You know, we didn't fish. We never had the night bites, and we never really even fished them like that, you know. But it was not the volume, not, you know, the size, intensity and the size of these fish that we're seeing now. We didn't have the techniques or the tackle for for the most part overall, you know. Um, so it's a very special time. But let me tell you what, take care of the crews because let me say, they're, they're working 20-hour days, folks. They're not getting much sleep. They're right. working their behinds off, and my hat's off to them because it's not easy. I know. I don't know how I'd hang, you know, in, in today's situation, you know. Uh, so, you know, um, it is it is a very special time. It's, uh, you know, we're blessed to have this particular fish, you know, and who knows how long it's going to happen. It cycles, you know. We might, uh, you know, I think for most guys, your freezers are done. They're chucked full of bluefin. Probably time, and I keep saying it, you know, at one point or another, we will see albacore again. I'm sure, you know, um, we've that, had a, we had a sprinkling of a handful here and there, but you know, they, they've got to be around. They've that doesn't around. mean though, if we do see Albuquerque, it doesn't mean that it's the end of the blue. Oh, right? no, 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 not at all. Not at all. They can coexist mm -hmm. and we could have a they season have, on both those. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We Incredible. may even back off the bluefin. I mean, like I look at most of the guys now. I mean, after we give away so many and everything else, I I have call guys tell them come down, meet the boat, come get a whole fish, because it becomes a a problem, you know, where you have all these big fish, and I have the guys before I leave tell them stand by for a call, you know, we'll let you know ship to shore day before whether you know bring the big ice chest, bring your truck or whatever, because the biggest problem now is when you do catch a lot of those. What's your processing rule going to be? You know, and so what I do is I, you know, it's my dad expensive, always, right? Oh, it's very expensive. And my dad always had a policy. He says, give it away fresh. Let everybody enjoy it fresh rather than a frozen chunk. And he, and he's right. You know, so we do, before we go make arrangements with friends, hey, I'll call you. You got to come down and get it because I'm not going to process out this amount of fish at this price, you know. So, right, and I'm done cutting fish. I did that for so many years. I said, No, I used to like no doing it now. I'm over it anymore. Yeah, yeah, I want to go home, play with you know, play with the grandkids, see Gail, you know, do something, you know, with the family. So, yeah, it's changed, it's yeah, it really changed. has. But you're right, these process guy yeah. on the independence, our uh, five day trip, he told yeah. me his processing bill was a thousand dollars. Oh, yeah, no, at right. the Christmas party, yeah, he told me. yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, way past that. Rudolph, yeah, sorry, Gail. <laughs> yeah, that's our little saying. Oh, yeah. hey, is Gail watching? <laughs> you're gonna get, she's going to start mm. posting now. Yeah, we'll come up the warden. All right. Yeah. Cube Ball says, uh, thumbing a drag with a leather flap. Mind-blowing. I and remember back in those. The day, yeah, I kind of do, too. I remember those. It was on a little swivel. It sat on the, you had to pull the bar out, put it on, and they would flip back and forth. Yeah. You could thumb it, yeah. Yeah. I don't think, no, I never used one, but I remember seeing some old timers with them. And I'm like, what I, I is that? I never used it either. I had my old. You see the old guys with yeah, them, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's pretty crazy yeah. how. But, you know, you think about that. I mean, at the time, that was a hot technology. That was a new technology, you know, help them. But the only thing is, you know, how much pressure is that thumb putting on it? So it depends how, you know, and how much, you know, uh, how much efficiency did you drag Drags have, and back then the drags weren't as sophisticated in the material, didn't have the asbestos or different things. I mean, you know, they, they generated a lot of heat, so the hotter it got, the more drag you would lose because it would slip, right? So there's a lot of things now with the tackle that we have that you know, you're opportune to land some of the bigger fish on smaller tackles much greater. 
Yeah. Because of the tech, you know, it's pretty tech. amazing, really, oh, when yeah. you think about it, because you yeah. can hold so much spectrum. Absolutely. And you can scale down to a comfortable reel. Now that you don't have to cast some of those real big ones, generally not on a fly line. Generally, it's on a drop, you know. But it's got the drag pressures now. The drag plates are huge, you know. Um, you have line that's marked. I mean, everything's dialed in now, you know. So it's a much more efficient and, uh, you know, better way to fish, you know, more scientific way to fish. But it's grueling on the crew, folks. Oh, it is. It's grueling. These guys are working their behinds off, and my hat's off to them. I mean, you remember clearly, or I'm sure you do, like sometimes when you'd be a crew member at San Diego and the albacore were biting at 30 miles, you'd be like, oh, my God, I'm not going to get any sleep because we're going to fish till 5 now. Now you're cleaning have... fish for how many hours? Yeah, and sleep? all that. You don't you, get those hundred miles when those fish are biting at a hundred. You got a good sleep on the <laughs> yeah, way back absolutely. after you got all your work done and everything. But absolutely. now, I mean, they don't even get to sleep at night. Yeah, they're fishing. It's brutal. It really is brutal, folks. So make sure you take care of your crews. I mean, that's a huge part of it. It's not an easy job. I did that, you know. Yeah. So make sure you take care of the boys. Daniel Lightfoot, and yeah. uh, he's saying, hit that like button. Yeah, come on, hit that like button, <laughs> darn it. <laughs> What's wrong with you people? And Shot Sarkisian. He says, hi, Phil, and hi, Danny. Shot, it yeah, is so glorious. good to see you. The man from La Fogata Restaurant who oh, bought gosh. all the beans and the tortillas and the salsa and the arroz, the rice. Unbelievable. Thank you. Sean, Sean. you oh, are the that's man. That's Thank you for awesome. doing that. We got to go, yeah, we we gotta go to La Fogata in Sherman Oaks, California. Everybody, if you're listening, obviously you're listening. <laughs> You want to go to La Fogata. I was thinking go. about, you know what we ought to do? We ought to do a uh, a meeting out there or something. Invite the public. Schedule some. You can speak. I can speak. Sure. We're going to have a great to. meal. We should do that. Absolutely. Yeah. It would be a way Absolutely. to say thank you for feel. everything you guys. So you there's two of these guys. Doug and Shant now Perfect. is up there. <laughs> and you know what Shant means in Armenian? No. I have an iron trap mind. Lightning means lightning. He wow. taught me that. So cool. interesting stuff. So here we have this absolutely fantastic fishery in Southern California. I guess the next question I would have to ask you is, is fishing better now than you've ever seen it? Oh. That's a hard question because you grew up in a time when fishing was insane. No, well, you know, it depends. I mean, right. it's hard to even keep track of, like, what's going on locally and everything else because it gets over, overshadowed by, you know, by the big game fish, you know. Um, and hopefully things will cycle out, but we'll get our regular yellowtail rides and our yeah. But we had diversity. I mean, like I yeah. remember the, you know when we did the the trips Catalina Clemente, you know, we had the yellow, a good diverse fishing with halibut. You know, halibut has been phenomenal the last few years. Unbelievable. This year was fishing. incredible. Yeah, unbelievable. And, and they're catching them again. So you know, and and keep in mind, folks, everything cycles. You know, you're not going to get everything at once. Things will cycle, and so but just be prepared for it. I mean, that's. That's what a good fisherman is compelled to do. Be a, you know, a good fisherman is prepared to, to address any type of fishery. You know, I can go in my shed and I can have boxes that are set up for my calicos, for my tails, my yo-yo, my surface iron. I mean, you know, and for tuna or for wahoo or for, they're all different. But you know, that's the one thing in um, in preparation, folks, is you know, do your homework so you. I can't tell you how much tackle I got rid of over the years from the time I've been buying tackle from the time I had an allowance. You know, I put almost all my money into tackle. But over the years, you'll find out there's certain things. Of course, you upgrade with technology. Um, but there's some things there that are that work regardless how old they are, you know. There's some of the stuff that I'm fishing with, they, they almost call antiques and classics, and I don't even want to fish with them because I don't want to lose them. So there's, you know, you go through all these different things. But, um, yeah, having them all categorized, you know, for whether it's bass fishing, trout fishing, and, and, and unfortunately I do it all, including fly, you know. And, and there's times, there's times, and I think I mentioned this too, where – I made a huge mistake when you told me to tell me to bring a fly rod down to Guyana to fish the Arapaima. I'm going, yeah, I'm going to fish a 300 pound fish with a fly rod. You got rocks in your head. He was right because when Pete and I were casting and he, Pete Demers is very competitive. We're pounding the water. 
that every time that lure hits the water, it spooks these Arapaima. They got very sensitive ear stones. And after four casts, they sink out for half an hour. You don't see them. You won't see them. They're air breathers, right? And then they'll come up and get air, and then you got a shot. But if you don't make a perfect cast right in front of them, you know, it's going to be pretty tough because they'll sink out. But with a fly line, it lays down quietly on the water. doesn't spook them. And the minute I saw that, I kicked myself. I said, why didn't I listen to Steve? I mean, I'm thinking, are you nuts? A fly rod for these, three, for you know, 200 to 300 pound fish. But I thought about it. I go, once you see the scenario and you're, they're carrying these canoes off the main river into these lagoons that the water's trapped in. These bigger pond are trapped in these big lagoons. How cool is that? And it's only, yeah, it's maybe four to six feet deep in these places. Oh, my God. two leaves around the edges. But you got two guides, one in the front, one in the back, and two guys fishing. And so they're paddling you around the lake. So when you hook a fish, they will chase it. As the fish, the fish, big fish goes in toward the weeds, one of the guys will jump out of the water, get in between the weeds and the fish, and the fish will veer out. Really? So extremely landable. And when I saw that, I go, what an idiot. You know, Steve told me to bring a fly rod. But I saw that because the way Pete and I are competitive with our casting, we're hitting that water, making so much noise with the splashes that they sink out. So with a fly, it lays down quietly, and you can strip. And now knowing that you're in four to six feet of water, you know, and they could jump, they'll jump out anytime it gets near the toolies, and they veer out. They're very landable with a fly rod. So that for any of you fly fishermen, that's probably one of the epitome. You know, I mean, one of the. Uh, Apex predators on a fly that you can get and explosive. They jump out. They're very they're closely related to a tarpon. They're air breathers, you know. Uh, exciting to watch because they will come out of the water. I got some footage on on that's another film I gotta I gotta I had a go. You got all kinds of stuff yeah, we gotta I just gotta into. figure out how to pull it off. That's where I'm I'm really ch mentally challenged with the you know electronics and all that stuff, you know. It's terrible. I bought all these equipment, I just don't know how to use them. We'll get yeah, it all figured smart. out. Yeah. But I have footage of all this stuff, yeah. All right, Q-Ball says he has been to La Fogato restaurant, and he <laughs> says it's the bomb. Yeah, so awesome. we definitely got to do it. Q-Ball says, it, I've never seen multiple boats coming back with 30 to 40 to 50 halibut like this year. It's insane. I've been in this fishery since 89. That's a lot of damn halleys. I've been in it since. Phenomenal. Well, yeah. You and I have been yeah. in it since. Yeah. The late 60s, maybe? Oh, yeah. yeah I've never I, seen I've halibut never fishing seen like this that. good. No. Have you? No. Totally no. Agree, agree with you, q no. Yeah, I mean, it's not, they used to be in the old days. We had we had pretty good bites like that out the bull ring, you know, down in Tijuana. Yeah. You know, we, we drift and we get limits down there back in those days. But, you know, that was long. That's been long gone. I haven't seen that in ages. I know. But, that, yeah, this is phenomenal. That know? sand bass fishing off the bull ring and halibut. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, remember you'd go like on a Coronado Island trip if you were leaving like at midnight or something, you'd go there, limit everybody out on that, and then shoot over to the islands for That's yellowtail it. fishing the that next morning. It. That was it. So Absolutely. I guess those guys were fishing at night, some of them. <laughs> <laughs> some yeah, of but we guys. were getting back from the Coronado trip. Well, a lot of times we're getting back at two in the afternoon. Yeah. And right. we were done. Right. You know, it was phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And you're close. Yeah, Which exactly. Nice. Makes for a nice trip. Yeah, it's a stone throw. Fish guy, how much do you think the inshore gillnet ban that happened in the 80s um, helped the inshore, near shore halibut and sea bass? I think that myself oh, is the definitive, huge. right? Huge. At Fish guy, huge, yeah. Huge, absolutely. Both Danny and I One are in agreement on that. Well, you know. I think that's what did it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's very easy to wipe out a species with a, a gillnet. And the problem with the gillnet, it's an indiscriminate killer. It will kill any species. It doesn't matter. It's not, it doesn't have a kill choice. a lot of non target well, fish. Real, you have a short, you could release them and put them back. Right. Know? So, yeah, it doesn't, well, I mean, once it's dead, what are you going to do? And what they do, if it's, it was an illegal fish, they just take it off and throw it back because if they get caught with a short fish, they're fine. But yeah. you, you just kill the fish. Right. So it's not a very efficient It's a waste, it's right? Not, it's not. So, you know. Um, How about do, mesh size? Does that help, or I, I think it would help, but they st mm. you still have a lot of incidental death. Yeah, you know because of the damage you do, whether you're just knocking off the slime off a lot of these fish or or not. You know it, it does hurt them. You know, so I 
I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of rod and reel. I think it's always the best way, you know. And I mean, in some areas, you, you can go to a barbless with certain fish if it comes down to it, you know, a barbless hook, you know. Shoot, uh, it was you. I think it was, yeah, it was the Apollo this year where I watched you. I was filming. Oh. I was sitting in a chair and I watched you and you tried to hook a fish and you missed it. And I was watching. I go, uh oh, Danny's on to something here. And you ran to the bait tank, came right back to that spot again. I go, he just dumped a flatty, and he's going to get that same flat. And the next thing I know, you're hooked. You got a nice big flatty. Beautiful fish comes to gaff. That was cool watching you do that. Yeah. You know, and, and that comes from me watching everybody, too. I mean, so if you're, if you're an astute angler, <clears throat> you're watching everybody on the boat. You know, maybe it's a novice guy that's next to you, and all of a sudden you see his rod tip go, and then he goes and misses it. Well, <laughs> bingo, you know, watching and paying attention to everything that's going on in the boat, folks, is a huge, huge deal. And, I mean, I had that uh, luxury, and, and, and that was my job as a skipper, I mean, to, to keep an eye on all that. My crew did that, too, you know. Uh, blessed to have the kids that we had working all these years on the boats. They were all, and these guys, are, they all escalated to captains, and they were all great captains, you know, but had to do with how we were brought up via Taka and, and, and the old school that taught us, you know, and, you know, a lot we just talked about before we started the show with Tom Durr and, you know, and Tony Westa, you know, guys that we were around and guys that we mentored under, you know, we learned a lot, you know, I learned, and Russ would, Russ Eisner would pull me aside, tell me different things. Uh, he was unbelievable. We'd go to Catalina with him, and he would charter my boat. Here he is. He's an expert at Catalina. He didn't need to go on the Mustang, but he would charter it. He would charter our boat. We'd go to a spot, and he would say, you know, hey, we're going to pull about 40 or 50 calicos, a couple of halibut, maybe a sea bass. And he was right. He was unbelievable. You know, not just the innovator and the, the man that developed Spectra, but just as a, as a fisherman, too. You know, so we were blessed being around these guys. They were brilliant. So I credit, you know, being in the company of some of the greatest fishermen in the world, you know. And you, you really look at it and you think about it. They really were all these guys, all the captains and a lot of the, and, and a lot of the fishermen, a lot of our fishermen. We just got, we have great fishermen because they're technically astute. They watch, they learn, you know. How, how many times have you seen a guy, well, they, they're not biting today, this well, they're not biting. They're, they're biting. You didn't figure it out. Right. You know, so it's, we don't generally see as much of that as you have the guy that runs through the whole gamut, will tr exhaust every method and mode of, of applying some type of fishing technique, whether it's throwing iron, throwing plastics, throwing the live baits, but they will exhaust everything. And they're not going to say, well, it was a tough day. It was, it was bad weather. It says, no, it's, we didn't figure it out. You know, for the most part, that's that's the answer, you know, and I got resigned to that. And the more I fish, the more I realized, you know, it's not on Mother Nature as much as it is on you. Yeah. You know? So to figure it out, figuring it out. Yeah. Yeah. And on most days, can you figure it out? You know, are there days when you can't? There's, there's some they... days. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't lie. I've had so, so many skunks, you know, when that particularly when we're chasing the trophy, trophy bass and stuff like that. But, you know. That's still related to looking at conditions, current. And the, the problem is I'll sit there and watch bass shows on TV. And, you know, I watch these guys. One thing that bugs me is the, the way they technically fish. Like I was telling you, the, the hook sets and the way they're fighting fish, you know, with, they're, they're up here getting one-tenth of the pressure out of the rod as opposed to down here. Yeah. You know, and the fish are jumping. Well, if you have less pressure and they jump, guess what? There goes the hook, you know. So it has to do with fishing correctly. But it has to do with um, reading the water. And now that these guys have these, um, it's virtually like a scanning sonar now, you know. Okay, so this is, like I said, 2023. Well, George Mew and I went down to San Diego, I think it was 1981 with the West Mars. And that changed the game, folks. Changed the game for the sport fleet. You know, because now, I mean, if you don't have a scanning sonar, you know, you're not in the game. But, I mean, we had a tremendous edge back in those days before anybody had those things. But our mind process is different when you do figure that out. Then when you take that part of it, you know, where you see the fish, 
you implement it now with the current, and most of the guys didn't know that on many of these lakes we had current. You know, so it's not just casting on this on a on a particular point. We're on that point. Is, it, is there a rock on the point? Is there a dog leg on it where you want to fish the dog leg instead of just straight out the point? You know, there's a lot of these technical things that that we picked up, and we we're blessed to have run sport boats because we 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 saw that, you know, and um, that gave us a little edge, you know. No guarantees. I I want to tell you, I took my lumps just like everybody else. But, you know, there's a lot of times you learn more on those tough days than you do on the days where you flat out kill them. So, you know, that's a plus, too. So you have to think of it like that. You know? Don't miss Gary Loomis right here, 4 p.m. this Saturday. Danny and Gary have so many stories that are going to be absolutely not only hilarious, but you'll learn a lot about fishing. It's going to be that great combination of oh. great entertainment and learning together. You know, and, and he can give you... I'll have Gary run through the rendition of graphite that he gave me back in those days. And it set, it, it set my game, especially with bass fishing. But then I got him to do some of the first straight graphites for saltwater too. So, um, you know, we're, we'll go through the technical aspects of it. But that had a lot to do with the ses- success. And if you look at our market here in Southern Cal, you know, most of us were into a lot of that high-tech stuff well before a lot of people in the country. You know, and like I, I was telling you guys, too, that I'll sit down and watch a, a bass show and, and I'm watching these guys high stick while they're fighting a fish. Well, excuse me, you got one tenth of pressure and you're wondering why your fish jumps out of the water and throws a hook. It's because you got one tenth of the pressure here that you did if you you pull like we're pulling on when we're fishing tuna, you know. So a lot of the technique has a lot to do with the efficiency in our landing rates, too, especially in dealing with the big fish you know, but just in fishing in general, you know, you'll learn a lot. And we'll talk to Gary about um, how he developed some of the things that you guys may not even understand much about, but I'll have him explain to you about this, the graphite scrims, his first one to utilize that, but that made all the difference in the world too, you know. I feel like we just started tonight's podcast and we're we're about ready to wrap it up, believe it or not, because Tony's going to throw us out, but we do have a few more questions. If you have any more questions, keep them coming. Cue ball, maybe you knew some of these guys. I know you did. Because I did. But he said, I started with Ray Sobiak and Irv Grisbeck, the producer, and the Trilene Big Game. I miss those guys and those days. Did oh, you know Ray? Did oh, you know? I knew them all. Yeah. You knew Irv, right? Yeah, I knew Irv, too. Yeah. yeah, I did, too. Yeah, yeah. Irv was a funny guy. Yeah. A little yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. Him and uh, Hot Dog. Hot Dog ran that boat. Mike uh, yeah. Jewett. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah right. Mike Jewett that's ran. Right. The, the, the Big Game. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. What What is the Big Game now? Do you know? Is it around? I or? think the big. Was it the? Big, I lose track of all this stuff. The man. big game, I think, became the champ, and the champ went aground down in Mexico. Oh, okay. I think that you're gonna have to check me on that. Fact check me on that one. Yeah, cue ball might producer, know the answer to that. Producer was an old uh, 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 seaway boat, I think. Yeah. Or say no, no. Was it seaway or was it that uh, boat's still around? Yeah, it's yeah. the company is out of H and M, right? Yeah. 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 Yep. The chief, cue ball says. Trialing big game became the chief. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. Yeah, I get them mixed up. That was the chief was I, that was that the, that was an old Ditmar then. If you're going back that far, yeah. But yeah, we were sitting I'm in Salsi Puedas. We were sitting there trying to make squid or something on the trialing big game one night, and it was windy and it was cold and it was miserable. And Bob Alvarez and I were sitting out there, and we could see a campfire on the beach and hear Mexicans singing. And we're both looking at each other like, how can we get in there <laughs> and go have some carne asada tacos, <laughs> man? Because it's miserable out here right now. So, oh, my God. Fun stuff. Well, I can remember the first uh, Irv's first glass boat was a sundown, right? Yeah. And it was kind of configured. And we used to tease him. We said, hey, it kind of looks like a Winnebago, you know. And, and But I mean, <laughs> but it had the lines were different on it. But it was a glass boat back then, yeah. Was Irv a good fisherman? Yeah, or, yeah, he was. Yeah. He was. It was all very competitive back there, you know. Oh, I remember super Ray was, Yeah, Ray too, you know. And, and Ray was fortunate to have. He had some good boats. He started out with the darts old boat. I think it was, you know, the old. Uh, it was a single screw. What the heck was that called? It was a Dipmar, you know, sixty-five foot Dipmar, single screw. But it'll come to me. But 
he started out with that. But those, yeah. fi- those boats fish so well, those little dip bars. Oh, they do, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. No question. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're coming to the end unless somebody else okay, has folks. another question. Danny, so we're Saturday. Waiting for you. We will see you at, we're thinking four, Phil? Four o'clock, yeah. Four um, o'clock or so on Gary's Saturday. coming in on a flight, so if it's in. a little late. Yeah, it might be hang It might in be there, 4.30 or we something. we will be here for sure. Yeah. You know, and it, trust me, it'll be worth it to have him on, to ask him questions. I mean, he was the. How old is Gary, by the way? He's up there in the seventies. Okay. Up there in the so like seventies. Trying to scare him with a rubber no, snake no, maybe or something. Even more, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's out of the question. No, we don't want him to have a heart attack on. Oh no, camera. he won't. He won't. I mean, some of the stuff yeah. he pulls. Nothing. I mean, just the. the so that the would be within stuff. That would be within reason. Oh. Don't tell me that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Trust me. With Gary, anything goes. We pulled so much stuff, and you're going to hear about some of these pranks that we did, people. You're going to die. You're going to die. Well, we got to like prank said, him right have, the... Yeah, you may have to put on some pampers because you may be wetting your pants from laughing. So, How do you think Doug would look in a uh, cop uniform? He came in and arrested Gary or something <laughs> on, on a prior. <laughs> coaching? Yeah. On a prior. <laughs> I think that might work. Oh, worry. my that God. That might be good. No, we're All right. Yeah, Cue Ball we'll said he did it. a lot of three days, a lot of three-day trips on the – uh, big, game. big game, and uh, yeah, I had a oh, yeah. great time on that boat. Um, really fun awesome. times in San yes. Diego. Remember uh, when you were leaving on Albuquerque trips out of San Diego? That place, Fisherman's Point Loma, H and M. It sounded more like the Indy Five Hundred at night you when know, those guys are revving the engines, and you're a kid, and you walk down, and you could feel the electricity. It's, it's buzzing through your body. Yeah, and it was almost like that. And whoever fired up in the fleet between the three landers. By the sound, I could I could tell you the boat. Yeah, just by the the sound, they all had a different different sounds a system to them, you know, and the way they sounded. When they Pretty crazy, out. huh? Yeah, but you know, when, when you're out there, you know, it's it's important. But but uh, with with me, I mean, I was I uh, had my groups down because of the charter boat. I didn't leave at eleven. We left before. I wanted to get first crack at the receivers, and I wanted fresh water ahead of me. I didn't want to be in anybody's way, so. You know, and my groups understood that, so they made the efforts to get down there. But, you know, you, you can reap the benefits from that. You yeah, know? heck yeah. So you're going to hear a lot on Saturday, folks. Stand, you guys, like I said, you, you're you going to have a gut ache from laughing. I guarantee you that. So I all have right, this, good I have stuff. Cue ball says we got Albies and Bluefin on those big game trips in the early 90s. Man, that was oh, good absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Danny, thanks again. Another great Phil, show, my it. friend. See you guys on Saturday. Totally enjoyed 4 it. 4 o'clock. Saturday at 4. Hit that like button, and we'll see you back here for a special edition of the Danny Cadota Show, Saturday at 4 o'clock. Danny, thank see you ya. again. Thank you, folks.